Thank you to Kenneth Copeland Ministries for sowing the airtime for this broadcast. There's enough power in every sick room and in every hospital room to raise up that sick one that may be describing you. Yes, you yes. may be in a sick room. Yep. You may be in a hospital room. And I want to remind you, power is present. That power is there to do a work. Believe in what's present, not try to get something, but notice that he's already made it yours. It's present right where you're at. Say, I receive that power. I receive, I receive that power. I receive it right now. I receive it right From now. From the top of my head. From the top of my to head. the soles of my feet. The soles of my feet. We want to welcome you to Jesus the Healer today. We're so grateful that you're joining us. Thank you for being a part of this broadcast, receiving of it. Amen. And it is a joy to bring the word that is our help. Amen. And uh, we're so grateful that you're hungry for the Word of God. Why is that we're hungry? Because we want to be doers of this Word. Amen. Not hearers only, but doers. We have been on a series called Miracles and Reverence, and we're going to continue this direction today and in some upcoming episodes, so you don't want to miss it. Go back and watch any episodes you might not have seen in this series, because there's so much said that we don't always have time to repeat. Amen. Amen. So we have been using as our starting place a statement that Brother Hagen, Kenneth e. Hagen, was the spiritual father to my husband and I. And he made this statement and he said, when reverence and honor are restored, there will be a restoration and multiplication of the miraculous power of God. Right. Amen. Yeah. Well, we need the power of God. Right. We need the miracle power of God. This That's earth right. needs the miracle power of God. Right. The church needs the miracle power of God. Our lives need the miracle power. And there's no sense in living without miracle power when it's available to us. Right. You know, for over 2,000 years, since the time of Adam, um, since, well, longer than that, 6,000 years or so, since the time of Adam, power was available but unaccessed. And I'm talking about electrical power. It was present in the earth all along. And since men have learned how to cooperate with that power, conduct that power, harness it, channel it to certain locations, how much better it made life. How much, let, let's say it this way, how much easier it made life. It's not just left to human power. Now we have, we have gas-powered engines and fuel power, all these kinds of energy, energized ways of moving that it's not just dependent on human natural energy and strength, but we have this other um, power available to us. It moves things along quicker. It's the same thing with the power of God. It, it is so far um, in front of natural power in front of electricity power. It excels it, but I'm just saying it does, it makes life easier when we're, when we're operating with power, not just human strength, not just human ability, but divine power. Part of that divine power we need, miracle power, Amen. healing power, Amen. delivering power. Yes. Look at this, resurrection power. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes. All of these flows of power uh, are, are out of God's flow, yes. out of God's realm, yes. the faith realm realm, the spirit realm. And so we need in this earth a flow of that miracle realm, that miracle power, God's realm. Amen. So we want to cooperate with it. Brother Hagen is letting us know what facilitates or gives way to the power of God. First of all, there must be an honor and a reverence that we hold for God, for his word, for his power. Amen. Amen. And so we don't want to cheat our lives of the power that God wants us to receive simply because we did not know our part. And our part involves being honorable. Our part involves being reverent toward God. Uh, when I talk about reverence, I'm not just talking about a, si a silent, still posture. I'm talking about putting first what God puts first. Amen. Amen. 
uh, his movement, his kingdom. It says in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why? Then all these things will be added to you. You don't have to chase them down. You don't have to spend your life going after something that his kingdom has already provided when his kingdom is put first. Amen. So when we're reverent toward God, we're putting first what ought to be first. When we're honorable toward God, we're putting first what ought to be first. God and his word, his spirit, and, and, and for our own, our own individual lives, his plan for our lives. Amen. Putting that first, that's, an, that's a flow of honor. That's a flow of reverence. If we don't put these things first, then uh, our lives will do without what God intended for us to have and what he provided and purchased for us to have. Greater flows call for greater reverence. And greater reverence is how we access greater flows. Amen. Amen. We have been taking as our keynote scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. It reads, those who honor me, I will honor. So God is letting us know how do we receive of his honor? Honor him. Why? Because when we sow honor, we reap honor. What is this scripture telling us? Basically this, you reap what you sow. It's it's the law of sowing and reaping. And so God says, those who honor me, something's going to happen in return. He will honor us. And then it goes on and says, but they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Well, let's look at these. Let's look a little bit further at these words. To honor something means to give it, give it proper importance, proper regard. Something of honor is something weightier than the other matters of life. Amen. So honor includes recognizing what is weighty in this life. What's important. Um, It's to have regard for it. Make it a priority. Uh, To honor him is to put him first. Now, let's look at the other side of this phrase when um, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 30 says that they that that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Well, what does, what does that mean? You know, no believer says, I'm, you know, I'm going to choose to despise the word today. No one says, I'm going to choose to despise God today. That, that's never our intent. But sometimes failing to do and put certain things in place will end us up at the same place we don't want to be in. So it, it, to despise something is not to treat something as important. So whether we're intentionally trying to despise it, to not put it in its proper place, we are not giving it its proper role in our life. Um, To despise something is not to be, is to be light toward it or carry a lightness or treat it as trivial. Nothing of God is trivial. Nothing of God should be approached um, lightly, meaning not esteeming it and putting proper value or weight to, to it. So it's important how we respond. Because when, God, when the word says that uh, they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed, it's not saying that God's going to withhold from those people. It means if they respond um, without recognition for who they're dealing with, then it, it closes them down from being able to receive from the honorable one. So how we respond either opens us up or closes us down from being recipients of the flow of God's honor. Amen. So that's what it means, amen, to lightly esteem what ought to be valued and honored. Go with me, if you would, to um, Isaiah chapter 29. And we're going to look at verse 13. And I'm going to read out of the Amplified Classic translation. So we invite you, follow along with us. There's the scripture right there posted on your screen, but you may even want to pull out your Bible and take notes in there and make note of some things. Uh, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, and it reads, And the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, well, we're right so far, right? Right. To honor him with our lips, our mouth speaking words of honor. 
we're right so far, but here's the, the issue. But they removed their hearts and minds from me. So honor is not just an outward, if I could say this, expression without an inward reality, without an inward um, agreement of what we're saying. Um, It's easy to say words. It's another thing to live them. It's a whole nother thing to live them. And so this is where God is dealing with his people about is he said, you're saying the right thing. Your lips and your mouth move rightly, but there's no heart behind it. It matters what's motivating our words, what's motivating our actions so that we're not saying empty words. Without our heart behind it, those are empty words. They're meaningless. Um, Know this, in your heart is where your faith resides. Mm -hmm. If our heart is not connected to our words, there's no faith in our words, no matter how honorable they may sound. If there's, if there, if our heart's not connected, our faith's not connected. Amen. 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 So he's saying, involve your heart. Don't just give me words. You know, as a parent, when my kids were little, I would call it, don't give me lip service. That's right. Don't play word games with me. Yeah. Meaning you say the right words, but you're going and doing the wrong thing. And you're just telling me what you think I want to hear, but you're still doing what you want to do. That's what I called lip service. Well, God, this verse is basically God calling out the same thing, saying the right thing, but the heart is not in agreement. The heart is not connected. So there's no faith coming out of those words. So he said, let's read it again. For as much as the people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but remove their hearts and minds far from me and their fear and reverence of me are a commandment of men that's learned by repetition without any thought as to the meaning. Mm. Listen to that. Um, I want to back up a little bit when we, he talks about they've removed their hearts, not only their hearts, but, and their minds. Ah, Mm -hmm. so to be reverent involves our thought life. To be honorable involves our thought life. It involves our words. It involves our heart. It involves our thought life. It also involves our actions, our doings. Amen. Amen. So we can't just demonstrate honor in one of those places. It has to be in the heart. It has to be in the thought life. Why? When it's in the heart and the thought life, it becomes a lifestyle. When it's only in the mouth, it becomes a performance, meaning we're only performing it at certain moments. We don't want to just seem to honor God when we're in a church service or around other believers. We want to honor him as a lifestyle. That's when it's flowing out of the heart. Amen. Amen. We're not just selecting it as something for a moment. We're selecting it as the flow of our life. And so this is what he's talking about. What about honorable thoughts? Think about that. What does that look like? That means if we wouldn't say it to God, we shouldn't think it in his presence. Amen. Amen. We have to govern what we think on. We have to, to have an, to be honorable. We have to catch what's going on in our thought life. Pay attention to what's going on in our thought life. And people many times don't, they think, well, nobody knows what I'm thinking. So it doesn't really matter as long as nobody knows what I'm thinking if I don't voice it. But what we think starts, it it governs what we believe. It's going to end up governing how we speak. Amen. So it does matter that honor not just be in our mouth, but it's in our heart and it's in the way we think thinking honorable thoughts. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I'm not going to entertain thoughts against my spouse. I'm not going to entertain wrong thoughts against the brethren in the body of Christ. I'm not going to entertain thoughts against my loved ones. Not going to do that. I'm not going to entertain thoughts against my boss, my employer. Amen. Amen. Because when we're going to live a life of honor, it's going to touch into every arena of life. It's going to, it's going to require that we address ourselves in every arena, right? Um, Now it goes on in this verse. It says, but they removed their hearts and minds far from me and their fear and reverence for me 
or a commandment of men that is learned by repetition. Notice this. They have been told what reverence and honor, how it sounds, and so they're performing that. They're performing it, but the heart isn't in it. The thought life is not facilitating it the right way. It's just a learned response. It's not heartfelt. It's not sincere. Listen, God wants sincerity of his people. Amen. He wants us sincere. We're not, we we can't play games with God. You know, we might can dupe some people. You know, growing up as kids, we were, we thought we were duping our parents sometimes, (laughs) didn't we? And they weren't duped as much as we thought they were. We might dupe our friends sometimes when we're young and growing up, but you can't carry that kind of flow into our dealings with God. He won't be duped. <laughs> There's, it's not possible. And so he's looking for sincerity. He's looking for genuineness. He's looking for our heart involved. He doesn't want us to perform something toward him because we think that'll please him. He wants us to be a doer of the word because it's in us and it's now found its home in us and it's governing us from the inside out. A performance is just from the outside without the inside involved. But God deals with us from the inside out. And that's what this verse is showing. Amen. Know, know this. Um, well, let me, let me go ahead and read again the last phrase of Isaiah 29, 13. He said, their fear and reverence for me are a commandment of men, meaning this is something they've just been taught. We have to be taught, but it has to go beyond teaching. It has to become ours. So he said, the fear and reverence for me are a commandment of men that is learned by repetition. Look at this next phrase that the Amplified Classic says, without any thought as to the meaning. Meaning this, what's connected to my reverence? What's connected to my honor? What's connected to my lack of sincerity? If I'm showing reverence and honor, but there's no sincerity, what's that? How's that going to play out and affect my life? You see, they're they're not giving any thought to it. So when we're thinking about things rightly, we think of them from the inside out. We think of what it's going to do to us inwardly. As we show reverence to God, it's going to, it's going to help us in our spiritual life. It's going to help bring a maturity. It's going to help bring a sincerity. It's going to put a demand on us that we're going to be pleased that we addressed in us. Amen. We are the ones who have access to our own heart. Now, when I talk about heart, I'm not talking about the organ of the heart. Understand me. When the word is talking about the heart, primarily it's talking about the center of man's being, the spirit of man, the, the, the central part of man. If we were to say something, the heart of the matter, we might have that phrase that in a discussion we're saying, well, we haven't yet touched on the heart of the matter. We're not talking about something that's pumping. We're talking about the central importance of this, the place where it, where it really matters. The same thing with our heart. We are the only ones who can instill something in, our, in, our, in the core of our being, in our spirit man. God can't do that. He can only offer us his word that we prize it and we take possession of it and we make it part of our being. We drive that word into our spirit. Amen. We instill that into our spirit. A parent, a pastor, or no one else has the ability to, if I could say this, um, instill something in your heart. All a parent can do is offer it. Here's the right way to think. Here's the right training. I can't make you think this way. Now, I can put some things in place that will bring reward when you think right, and I can put some things in place that will bring correction when you don't choose to think right or respond rightly. But a parent cannot reach in, (laughs) right? A pastor cannot reach in. But I tell you who can help us, the Holy Spirit. He will work... In, he works in, inwardly with us, but even he cannot force into our spirit what we won't agree with. 
Amen. Amen. But we do have divine help yes. in the tending of our heart, yes. the word and the spirit. Yes. Amen. Amen. We choose what enters our heart. Make sure reverence is the flow of our heart. Yes. Make sure honor for God is an inward thing, yes. not just an outward thing that people see, but God knows differently right. about us. Amen. We want what we show people to be the same thing that God sees in us. Meaning it's, it's a living thing in us, a living thing in us. Um, so we, we, we know in a service that um, our hearts need to be engaged. Amen. When we go to church, we don't just want to perform as though we're there and engaged. We want to be engaged. You know, just, and we have to learn this. And listen, I know this about me growing up in school. I was present in classrooms, but I wasn't present. <laughs> What's that mean? My interest was not present. I was not interested. I was tuning it out. I had my mind on something else. Um, and that would cost us when it came around to test time, didn't it? Yeah, it would cost us if we took that approach. Um, our, the test that the teacher would put in front of us would depict our level of interest, right? But even so, when it comes to the tests of life, how we have responded to God's word in a service yeah. at home, it's going to show up. Amen. It's going to show up. Yeah. But when we honor him and we reverence God from, with our, from our insides, that's going to show up too. Oh, yes. That's going to show up. Um, I, I remember the, the story of one minister. They were in a large uh, setting. It was like a, a big um, convention center and it was full of Christians and it was, there was a, a, a teaching service going on teaching the word. And this minister looked around and saw probably about 12,000 would have been in that building that day. That's what it held. And, um, it was just full. And this minister during the praise and worship and every, and most people's hands were raised and boy, people were singing, and the minister said to God, God, look at this. And they were kind of looking around. They said, isn't this just a joy to be standing in this congregation of all this multitude, loving you, worshiping you, singing. And I get to be here. I'm just so grateful. I'm in this setting of people loving you, worshiping you. And um, when they said that, God said to them, look again. And when they looked around again, God allowed them to see into the spirit realm. And they saw a shaft of light over here, a shaft of light over here coming from the people. And just randomly, there were a few shafts of light coming up from that auditorium. And God said, those are the ones who, are, who have entered in. They are worshiping me with their hearts involved. He said, the others have taken the posture of worship. Meaning they've got their hands raised, but their hearts aren't in it. Now, see, we have to practice That's right. that our heart be in it. That's right. That's right. We have to practice that. Yes. How, one way we practice that is we practice cutting out distractions. Yes. There may be the opportunity to be distracted all around us, but we have to practice not falling into and following those distractions. Yes. Why? Because uh, how, we, how we practice is how we're going to respond when we're facing a test, mm -hmm. when we're facing opposition. Yes. You know, if you take a, a, a child, a, a toddler or a, a young child to swimming lessons, it matters how they practice those strokes mm -hmm. yeah. because when they get in a setting where there's no mom around or there's no lifeguard or there's no one nearby and this, the water starts seeming to overwhelm them. It matters that they know that they have practiced right. Yes. Yes. Right? Uh, same thing in life. We don't want to be drowning simply because we did not practice having our hearts connected. Yes. When we went to church, yes. that, that word went in us. It's not enough to just be sitting where the word is heard. Right. We need to be where the word is heard. Right but it's not enough to leave that word in the room. It's got to get in us. Yes. Amen. Yes. We have to practice engaging our hearts. What's that mean? Being wholehearted. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Not half-hearted, wholehearted, meaning we're all in. We're all in. And we say this about our flow of honor and reverence. We're all in in honoring God. We're not just half-hearted about it, just saying the right thing, but we're expressing the right thing also through our heart. Amen. Uh, because reverence and honor is to be a flow of our life and it's to be something we easily turn to when pressure is on. Amen. Amen. Because why? When we show honor for God, when we show honor for what he has said to us, when we show honor for what his spirit is dealing with us about, in the face of opposition, in the face of pressure, we're going to see a miracle happen for us. Why? Because honor, uh, honor facilitates the miracle flow. Amen. It facilitates the miracle flow. And so many times we, we want to facilitate that, but we have to be taught. So thank God for the opportunity to get to spend this time talking about these things, teaching these things, ministering these things, because everyone needs it. And I know this, the, 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 the longer I walk with God, the more I grow in the things of God, the more vital I see these flows are. They, don't demi- they aren't to diminish in our life. Our honor is to grow. Yes. Our reverence for God is to grow. Yes. And we can grow in honor and reverence. Amen. And we're learning. I said we're learning. Well, there's more that we're going to teach along these lines. You don't want to miss upcoming episodes. And until next time, remember this, Jesus is the healer. God bless you. To watch or listen to today's message and other messages by Nancy Dufresne, visit DufresneMinistries.org. In Nancy Dufresne's classic book, The Greatness of God's Power, she teaches how God wants us to know His power that is in our direction. It belongs to us. Order this book now at DufresneMinistries.org. I invite you to get my book called The Healer Divine. This book is a study of the healings that happened under Jesus' earthly ministry. We study them line by line, word by word. And when we are skillful in understanding how Jesus ministered healing, then it helps us to be skillful in receiving healing, but also ministering healing. So we invite you to go to JesusTheHealer.org and purchase your copy today. God bless you. We invite you to join us for our annual camp meeting here at Ward Harvest Church in Marietta, California, June 3rd through the 7th. For more information and to register, please visit our website at DufresneMinistries.org. We trust you've enjoyed this message. Visit us at DufresneMinistries.org to learn of our upcoming meetings, share your testimony, submit a prayer request, or visit our online store. Thank you to the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries for making this production possible. We invite you to join us at World Harvest Church, home of Dufresne Ministries in Marietta, California, located at 23109 Palomar Street, Marietta, California. This is a word and spirit church. Join us in person or online Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time. For more information, go to DufresneMinistries.org.